Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whenever you're tuning in and wherever you're tuning in from everybody. We're going to get started with the live stream here momentarily. We'll give it another minute or so for people to join us. Bit of a last minute live stream here. So we'll give it uh, another little bit for people to join us, but let us know where you're tuning in from and hope you're doing well. And just sit tight. We'll get started here in half a minute or so. I see we have a ton of people joining the live stream. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining the stream. We're going to get started here in about 15 seconds. If you can smash the like, share the video with anybody last minute who can join us, and we'll have a great discussion here today. Uh, less than awesome news, but yeah, it's not the first time we've been let down in the MJ industry and uh, probably won't be the last. So uh, lots of positive things, but obviously not the news everybody was hoping for today. But we'll discuss all of this and more. We're going to be discussing excise tax uh, being excluded from the Canadian budget for 2024. And uh, we'll jump into it here in just a second. Just going to have a drink of water. All right, let's get started. Welcome back on the Pursuit of Wealth, everybody. It's Rod with Power Group. Your home for MJ stocks, crypto assets, news and interviews. Almost forgot what day it was. <laughs> but home to the best MJ community. Today is Tuesday. It's April 16th. It's been a crazy day for me today. Uh, just been all over the place. The last couple of weeks getting a new Airbnb set up. Uh, almost done though. I'm going to go over there, hang a piece of art that finally arrived that was late. And then uh, get the photographer over tomorrow. So... Uh, that coupled with uh, my daughter, uh, just under three months old now, uh, it's been a crazy couple of months, uh, but wouldn't change it for the world. But I hope everyone had a great day today. Uh, we're going to be discussing in this video, we're going to be discussing the excise tax being excluded from the Canadian federal budget in 2024. Came out today after market close. Overall, stocks are pretty muted after hours, not really seeing much. Uh, you know, it, it would have been a, a nice to have. Um, ultimately, we're going to get there. The fact that it's not in the 2024 budget, you know, Erwin Simon, CEO of Tilray, anticipated that we could see it. Other, you know, people in the industry were saying that it, it was a possibility. And then late, uh, you know, yesterday or the day before, I think there was some opposition. There was some uh, doubt that it was actually going to be included. And lo and behold, it actually wasn't included. So no excise tax reform in the 2024 budget. I'm not sure, to be honest, when the next time it could potentially happen, but I would more than likely expect it would happen when we least expect it, right? Typical. Uh, typical way that these uh, market makers work, right? And uh, regulators around the world, they try to do it. They try to do it so that they let the insiders know, their friends, their Wall Street crooks, right? Uh, they try to get them all positioned first. And then, uh, you know, retail is the last to know and generally happens when retail least expects it, right? So it's just the name of the game. Hate the, uh, hate, don't hate the player, hate the game. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, we can't beat them at their own game because we're just, you know, small fish in a big pond. So we just got to, Take it as it is and accept it, you know, and just do our best to try not to get too emotional, right? I know there's a lot of people that are uh, very upset today, but at the end of the day, uh, there's some, obviously it's a net negative, but there is some positive to this. The positive would be that, you know, well, it's not really that great for the small producers, but it's positive for the big companies that most of us are invested in, right? There's a lot of the, the small companies that are falling by the wayside that are unable to keep up with these uh, high tax regimes. And as a result, they're they're just they're going insolvent, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, that's probably going to be better for these big tier one companies. And to be honest, you know, all the major companies, the big alcohol, big tobacco companies, are invested in the tier ones. So they're probably you know they're probably lobbying the Canadian government and governments around the world to not embrace this too quickly because they want to take the market share, right? They want to get all of the small producers out of the way, even though they say that uh, you know it's all about uh, social justice and uh, undoing the harm and failed you know, war on drugs and protecting the little guy and the mom and pop shops. But we all know damn well that <laughs> it's all about the Fortune 500 and the Wall Street banks and the institutions and the hedge funds, right? And the, they're not going to be playing around in the small, uh, those splishy, splashy whales are not going to be playing in those small producers. They're going to be in the big producers, right? So we'll discuss all of this and more before we get to it. Make sure to smash the like. I would appreciate it. And if you're new, you can subscribe, take the bell, all that good stuff. You'll be notified on any future videos or when I go live. Uh, wow, over 50 people already on the stream. So thanks, everybody, uh, for joining the stream. Really do love each and every one of you who supported, uh, supported me along the way. If you want to support the channel even further, you can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, 
so the handle for that is at group pal going to be using that as my platform of choice going forward and i'm giving away an annual membership to the pal group private community if you scroll down on the community tab here on youtube uh, the details are there i'll be giving it away on 420 in celebration of that holiday and uh germany going legal in florida on the ballot uh, something that i didn't notice uh, or i wasn't aware of uh, that sort of came to light over the last couple of days is that and there was some interchangeable uh, verbal like commentary that was used uh, basically uh, the doj was basically handling rescheduling now but they're one and the same so doj and dea the dea is an agency within the overall department so the department of justice and you can see the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, is within that. So in my opinion, you know, the more you know, this should still be up to HHS and FDA, in my opinion. I mean, they literally decide what's medicine and what's not, and the Food and Drug Administration, right? Um, and it's just asinine to me. But to, you know, in my opinion, the DOJ and the DEA should enforce the law and punishments if you break the law. But I said, this is back ass words, as usual, with federal agencies, right? It should be the HHS and, federal, and FDA that's, you know, creating whether or not this should be Schedule 3 or Schedule 1 or descheduled effectively. And then the DOJ and DEA should enforce it. And, uh, and you know, if, if anybody breaks the rules, then DOJ gets involved and DEA, you know, enforces it. So it, to me, it's just ass backwards, like I said, um, as normal. Um, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> so uh, and then, yeah, HHS and FDA are one and the same as well, right? It's just a different agency within that department. So uh, that was something that came to light. But, you know, a lot of people didn't know this myself included i'll be the first to admit but it just goes to show you how convoluted and complicated they make things just so that the average everyday person joe and jane like myself and everybody listening it's just that much harder for us to understand right and that's they want it that way they it's by design they want it to be as confusing as boring as you know hard to, to follow as possible so that people just lose interest or just don't fully understand and what do we know about markets markets want to be uh, want to understand things. They don't like uncertainty, right? So the more you know. But MJ Biz Daily reports that no MJ, MJ excise tax reform in 2024 Canadian budget. I didn't actually go through it. Um, I wanted to do some live coverage as well, but uh, unfortunately I had a couple long-term uh, tenants that were looking to view a property that I had. And uh, like I said, I was getting ready, uh, getting my daughter fed and all that other stuff. So just finally getting a t chance to do it now. But let me know in the comments what you think of this. Um, I, again, I don't think it's never going to happen. I think it will happen. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, rescheduling in the U.S. is probably going to happen. Schedule 3, removal of 280E. That's the biggest thing hindering the industry in the U.S. is 280E. Kiralee said over $350 million, probably close to north of $400 million now, has been paid just under that tax code alone to the U.S. government. So if that money that otherwise when it went to the IRS hit their bottom line, they said they'd already be paying a dividend to investors. So let that sink in. Everybody thinks it's going to be you know, decades out before we see any dividends. Well, let that sink in. Cureleaf said that they'd already be paying a dividend more than likely if it wasn't just for 280E. So if rescheduling happens, that goes away. And what's the biggest thing hindering the industry here in Canada? Excise taxes. So it's a taxation problem. So it's, we're still a while away, right? Even if we got, you know, the DEA or whatever you want to say, DOJ, even if they came out and said, you know, we approve HHS's recommendation to Schedule 3 or effectively deschedules it. I, I don't think that's going to happen right away. I think it'll be incremental. I think ultimately we'll get to descheduling. But imagine if they came out today and said, okay, we approve HHS recommendation to Schedule 3. We're going to get the wheels in motion. We're going to make it happen. There'll be a 60-day comment period, right? And then it's going to take some other, uh, you know, regulatory red tape and hoops that they have to jump through more than likely. Who knows, right? They make it this complicated for, and we're not all legal experts either. So we just kind of take the legalese and, you know, make the best of it. But at the end of the day, it's, it doesn't really, it, like time is irrelevant. We've been in almost a four year bear market at this point. It's been brutal. Who cares if we have to wait another six months, a year, two years, even another four years at this point, right? We waited this long. Uh, unfortunately, the stock market is a mechanism from transferring wealth from the impatient to the patient. So we just have to be patient and our time will come. And at the end of the day, this, this, this will change. It has to change. There's already been, it's already been brought up in multiple different uh, departments, essentially, and through multiple different facets. So the fact that it's even being discussed and this much eyes on it, it it's just an inevitability in my opinion, right? And then, like I said, if, the, if we get rescheduling in the U.S., it's going to be a while before it actually gets enacted, right? It's not like, oh, they approve rescheduling to Schedule 3 and then it instantly gets enacted. It's going to be a couple of months. So it could be another, it could be this month, could be next month, could be a few more months before we even get the announcement. If we do get the announcement and they do approve it, I mean, they could not approve it as well. But, you know, ultimately, that's going to change as well. Even if they don't approve it right now, they're going to have to 
reschedule it eventually. Like you can't leave it on the same uh, list as heroin, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So eventually it will get done. But like I said, if it happens, let's say this month, it's going to be another 60 days, probably be the end of the year, if not early 2025, where it actually gets enacted and 280E goes away, it's nullified. And then, you know, by then we should see, you know, Health Canada potentially, or, you know, the whether they amend the MJ Act here in Canada as well, that's another way. I, I, again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I know for a fact that it's going to happen eventually. And like I said, even if rescheduling happens and 280E goes away, that buys us some time as well. And again, I think that it's probably going to coincide pretty pretty closely. Like we're probably going to see them both removed at the same time. 280E goes away, excise tax goes away. I think that's more than likely going to be in the in the cards, right? I think it's not a coincidence that we're seeing all this chatter around both at the same time, uh, which is going to be huge for the industry, right? Biggest thing in Canada and the U.S. So Canada's legal MJ industry is not getting any excise tax relief from the Liberal government in 2024. I see uh, <laughs> your first mistake, Joseph says, was thinking the Liberals would not would do anything right. Yeah, I mean, I don't trust most of these politicians as far as I can throw them. I absolutely hate politics, but uh, I mean, they did legalize it in the first place. So I guess we can give them a little bit of credit for that. But I, I hear you. I'll jump into the chat here towards the end as well. But everybody let me know what you think of this in the in the comments and your thoughts and opinions. And we'll jump into it real quick at the end. But budget comes shortly after two separate recommendations to the government proposing reform or review of the MJ excise tax structure. One from the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance and the other from the legislative review of the recreational MJ legalization. So, you know, the fact that we're getting this much attention, this much recommendations, this many eyeballs on it, it's it's only a it's only a positive long term, even though you know right now it's it's not so great. But it really does seem seem like they want to crush the smaller players, right? They want to gain market share to the tier ones. And uh, like I said, it's still a while before we more than likely see 280E go away. Even if we get rescheduling approved today, it'd be months before we see it actually enacted, right? So uh, not the end of the world in my opinion, but would have been nice to have. Would have been a nice to have, but not an absolute necessity. And you know the, the big that's why these big tier one companies. Uh, with these massive balance sheets and you know assets, they're the, they're going to be the ones that weather the storm, right? And the ones that weather the storm, both in Canada and U.S., you know, there's people in the U.S. that are starting uh, dispensaries and whatnot, starting MJ businesses. They don't even know that there's a 280E tax code, right? So it's just like a lack of due diligence and understanding, and uh, kind of you know, kind of onus is on them. But yeah, it'll come. Although those recommendations might have raised some hopes within Canada's legal MJ sector, insiders told MJ Biz Daily that the odds of excise tax reform in this year's uh, budget were uncertain. Any remaining hopes for tax uh, tax cuts were dashed when the budget was released Tuesday afternoon. So a missed opportunity, the 430-page primary budget document mentions the word MJ only once as part of the government's plan to introduce legislation that would allow Indigenous governments to create their own value, added sales taxes, on certain goods, including MJ. Canopy Growth Corp CEO David Klein said in an email statement that the Ontario-based company was disappointed that the Canadian government missed the opportunity to address the flawed excise tax regime in today's budget. But something, what did we just find out about Canopy? Shareholders approved the exchangeable shares and new class of shares and uh, the USA Holdings Company. So the fact that Canopy is going to become an MSO now when they deconsolidate those financials and they create Canopy USA, they're going to have acreage, Juana, and Jetty. So now they've essentially paved the way. This is another bullish catalyst, right? It might not reap rewards right away. We'll see the fruits of that labor later on. But this paves the way for other LPs and producers in Canada. You know, think of your Tilrays, your, uh, you know, your organograms, your t- your uh, SNDLs, whatever. This paves the way for them to potentially follow a similar blueprint and uh, and capture that access to the to the American market, and then also. If we get rescheduling into Schedule 3, that's going to open up medical channels in the U.S. as well for these Canadian companies. So uh, Cureleaf bought Northern Green Canada. MSOs are becoming LPs and LPs are becoming MSOs and vice versa. And it's only going to get bigger from here. And the mega merger phase and Tier 1 blue chip phase mergers will happen eventually. And that'll only happen after it's fully legal at the federal level in the U.S., right? And probably like five five years after that, right? The Amazons and the Apples and the Facebooks didn't happen uh, the second we got, you know, internet legislation and, you know, the crypto companies that, you know, if we get legislation, it's going to take time for the real winners and blue chip phase to to really emerge and to see who the long-term winners are going to be, right? It doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. And in order to see the blue chip phase, we need to have it legal at the federal level in the U.S. It can't be classified as in the same list as heroin. It's just asinine. 
This oversight signals a lack of commitment to the legal engine industry as well as the jobs and economic growth we create, Klein wrote. The failure to correct this broken tax regime is to protect the tier ones and to kill as many of the small producers. No, just kidding. <laughs> the failure to correct this broken tax regime and to leave other critical issues like potency limits unaddressed will continue to hinder the growth of the legal MJ businesses and compromise consumer access to safe regulated products. Absolutely. So it's only going to help combat the illicit market, but they don't want to do it, right? Because they don't want to go too big too quickly. And in my opinion, they probably want these smaller producers, all these lobbyists, they probably want the smaller producers to uh, to get weeded out first, no pun intended. But at the end of the day, you know, potency limit, that's only going to go up store cap doubling in Ontario from 75 to 150. All a great vote of confidence that we're going in the right direction. It's just we're moving at turtle speed, unfortunately. Top issue in Canadian MJ and also in US MJ is tax. Canada's excise tax, MJ excise tax structure is regularly cited as the top issue facing licensed MJ producers. The excise tax is levied before MJ products reach consumers who also pay sales taxes upon purchase. So it's just a double dipping, right? MJ flour and pre-rolls are taxed at either a flat rate of one Canadian dollar or uh, CA 72 cents per gram or 10% of the gram's wholesale price. Okay, whichever is greater. In light of the significant price compression in Canada's MJ market, however, the 10% rate rarely ap applies, a government briefing note to Canada's finance minister, minister acknowledged. MJ extracts and concentrates products are taxed at one cent per milligram of uh, psychoactive component. Try not to say that. As MJ Biz Daily reported, unpaid MJ excise taxes have been piling up with the government finding that some unpaid excise taxes are uncollectible. Hmm. Might that motivate you to do something about it? I guess not. The Canadian government also increased the industry regulatory fees for MJ companies this month. So essentially that's just like to operate as a uh, cultivar or, um, you know, different like nursery licenses, all those types of uh, different like, brackets and tiers of, of uh, licenses within the industry. It wasn't like a big hike. And I mean, these companies are making hundreds of millions of dollars, if not you know, millions or hundreds of millions and sometimes billions annually. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're too worried about that. It's excise taxes that we're worried about and then 280E. But overall, uh, Tilray, we're sitting flat here after hours. Uh, just bring up my watch list here. Let's get a couple. Yeah, we're sitting, that's the Canadian side. Said 184 on Tilray after hours. Organograms actually up a tiny bit as well. SNDL flat, CDC up a few pennies. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Like there's not not a whole bunch of movers here after hours. So it's pretty muted for the most part. We'll see how we are tomorrow a.m. when we uh, when the market opens. But uh, yeah, obviously not great. But I mean, there's so many catalysts, right? There's so many things on the horizon. I mean, obviously, I, I don't want to be a perma bull or anything like that. But it's hard not to be, right? Like we're, again, I, I don't know how to get this home, <laughs> this point home to people. It's like people are so impatient and I understand, right? Investor fatigue and it's been four years of a brutal bear market. Like our time is due, right? But um, at the end of the day, there's still countries around the world that offer the death penalty for simple possession of this plant, right? And this medicine. So the fact that it's not even recognized as medicine in the US and on the same list as heroin is just insane, right? And it's a schedule one, right? So eventually schedule three will happen. Medical channels will open up in the US. We'll see Germany, pillar two, for profit, right? And then rest of the EU will follow suit. More individual states will legalize, right? That's only got to put pressure on these elected officials to get something done either by passing laws or through descheduling effectively. But probably what we'll see is rescheduling, safe banking, up listening to the Nicene, the NASDAQ. We'll get the JP Morgans, the Morgan Stanleys, the Goldman Sachs of the world, the Wall Street banks positioned, then they'll deschedule it, right? And then, yeah, all the improvements to Canada. There's a lot to like here, but again, it, it's it's not going to happen overnight. And, you know, all of what I just said could take years to play out. And then even after those get, like, after those are initiated, after all of those catalysts happen, it's probably going to another be another few years before we see critical mass, right? So, you know, again, if you were investing in the dot com bubble, if you were investing in you know in two thousand after the dot com bubble, right, went from like nineteen ninety six to two thousand, and then the brutal bear market of the dot com crash in two thousand and one, you know, it took decades, right, to really see those massive gains. But I mean, look at NVDA. NVDA, NVDA went up like hundreds of percent over the course of like the last year. CGC went up like three hundred and some percent in like two weeks, right? So. 
the volatility goes both ways. That's what we're here for. We're here for the volatility and you can't have, you know, 100x gains or 50x gains or 10x gains without 80 to 90% pullbacks in brutal bear markets, unfortunately. So it is what it is, but uh, curious to jump into the chat here. Uh, SNDL will grow organically. I believe so as well. Uh, I mean, they did acquire Alcana. So like what, 80% of their revenue is from that uh, liquor uh, acquisition. So, you know, think of your Ace Liquor, your uh, Liquor Depot, uh, Wine and Beyond, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, overall, it's it's a great acquisition, I think, in a great company, very differentiated company with a pretty competitive uh, advantage and moat. So I just try not to be everything to all people and uh, try not to, you know, just focus on some key aspects of the industry and, and be you know, differentiated, right? And I think that's what we're starting to see in Canada is a lot of differentiation. Whereas in the US, we're not really a lot of the if you look at the US producers, they're all kind of the same, right? And I think they're going to go through the similar thing where we're going to have tons of CapEx, they're going to start, you know, we're going to see rescheduling, we're going to see company like they're already exiting a lot of the US producers are exiting markets in the US that they operate in to focus on other markets. What does that tell you? That tells you that they're, they're not really that set up well in terms of balance sheet or debt or access to financing, right? Why would they be exiting not so much profitable markets trying to focus on the more profitable ones, you know, Florida coming online, potentially Ohio, Pennsylvania. So why are they getting out of like, you know, different states like Nevada or whatever, and focusing on those if, you know, they're just making money hand over fist and they have, you know, the best balance sheet and access to funding, right? It just tells you that, you know, they're, they're trying not to spread themselves too thin and put all their eggs in one basket and focus on key markets. Try not to get too big too quickly, I think as well, learning from the Canadian market. But I mean, it is US, it's the biggest market in the world. But eventually, yeah, they're going to have to expand to different states, they're going to have to look at Cureleaf acquiring a Canadian operator, you're going to have to expand to Canada, Germany, international EU GMP uh, certification and facilities over there. And now it's very hard and expensive to build facilities from the ground up, right? A lot of companies are either retrofitting, or they're buying from other companies that you know, bought it for, you know, a crazy amount. And now they're getting it for pennies on the dollar, right? Or you can just buy a company and then get their licenses that way. You know, it's very hard to get these lotteries and these licenses sometimes. So it can be very costly. You know, sometimes these licenses are costing uh, 500,000 to a million dollars per license. And then if you want to buy a business and it's even more money, right? So that's all very CapEx intensive, right? And it's just going to, it's going to be interesting to see how it all gets weeded out. Again, no pun intended for the US companies, because a lot of them look very similar. Look at your Crescos, look at your Green Thumb, look at your Cure Leaf. Well, Cure Leaf's actually one one of the only ones in the US, in my opinion, that's very different. True Leaf, you know, very focused on the medical channel as well. But, you know, if you look at a lot of those companies like Merimed, you know, all these companies, they all seem very similar. Um, that's one thing I've noticed. And I think we're going to see something similar where we have that differentiation phase where, uh, you know, they we start to see certain companies merge with other companies and then we start to see them focus on different things like organogram being 100 percent mj focus canopy you know very uh ancillary type business as well with their stores in bickle and picks and shovels and then you know being focused on the u.s market becoming an mso very different they created a holdings company very different than what everybody else has done sndl into retail alcohol and mj and also touches the plant and vertical producer you have tilray who actually manufactures the alcohol and the craft beer they're focused on the craft beer component and the spirits which can later be infused with mj they have their distribution business their uh, their hemp business right their health and wellness and then their mj business right so they're very differentiated as well and they're into actual manufacturing alcohol whereas sndl is just like no we just want to do we just want to do the retail component, right? So very different businesses, high tide, largest non-franchise retailer, rate. Right? They don't actually uh, produce anything. So maybe they will eventually, um, but there's lots to, uh, to, to see or to like here in Canada, but there also a lots that remains to be seen in the U S plenty of cash to survive and thrive. Absolutely. Same with Cron, right? Cron sitting on like 800 million or something like that, close to a billion dollars of cash. BJ says true, Joseph. Absolutely. Pound that like, appreciate it. Silver. Come at you from Virginia. Nice. Virginia in the house. Welcome, welcome. Just hit the like button. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. This small fish will continue to buy the dips. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Same here. Obviously not financial advice, but all got to make up our own decisions, right? Would we have seen more movement beforehand if it was going to happen? Um, yeah, perhaps. Uh, very, very likely, right? Because the insiders know. Uh, but overall, you know, based on how much we pulled back 
on some of these names. Like CGC's down like what fifty percent in uh, a very short period of time, like a week or so. And then Tilray was also pretty much gave back that whole move uh, up toward three dollars USD, and then now down to like a dollar seventy USD. So pretty much the whole move was given back. Um, so the fact that we pulled back that much. And then we got the news that the excise taxes wasn't getting approved or uh, included in the 2024 budget. Probably softened that that blow a little bit, right, of this news. If we would have been running into this and then it got, you know, it, it didn't actually get included in that, then that would have been uh, pretty bad. All right. I anticipated that it would not happen. Yeah, at the end of the day, I thought it would happen, to be honest. I mean... It's kind of irrelevant at this point. Like it's going to happen eventually, right? If it happens now, uh, if it happens in six months, if it happens in a year, it has to. Something has to give. There's just no way. There's so many insolvencies, bankruptcies, creditor protection filings. Uh, there's so many uncollected excise taxes that haven't been paid. So eventually, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, eventually, all these companies are just falling, dropping like flies, and we're not collecting the tax anyways. So we might as well just lower it to a more reasonable amount and actually get the money. So we'll see. Would be tremendous if somehow because Tilray is the biggest might actually benefit and gain percent uh, more market share. Yeah, exactly, Craig. That's what we were talking about in that power group private community as well is, you know, it's almost as if they want the small producers to fail and small companies to fail so that the tier ones can benefit. And, you know, if you look at who these big companies are, big alcohol, big tobacco, you know, your Altrias, your British American tobaccos, your Imperial, your Imperial brands, your Constellation brands, they're all in the big tier one MJ companies in, in Canada, right? So... Um, they probably just want to weed these companies out just a little bit longer so that they can gain that market share. And one thing we noticed in Tilray's recent earnings report is that they're actually losing market share. But I think a lot of that has to do as well with, you know, them focusing on uh, on their beverage brands or alcohol brands and things like that as they look to because those are driving some high margins at the moment. And they're trying to make, you know, craft beer cool again, which I think is a great, a great plan because I love craft beer. It's, I'd never buy anything else other than that. And, you know, while I try to, you know, drink less alcohol and do more alternative um, options like MJ beverages. But at the end of the day, you know, I think craft beer is definitely on the up and up and it's not going away. You know, if you go to a any neck of the woods, right, you go to in a sporting event, whatever, you see them everywhere. And eventually, you know, when they when they have MJ beverages at sporting events and concerts, you, like you're not going to be able to just go buy a not going to be able to go up to the stand, get your popcorn, get your 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 beer and your pack of joints <laughs> they're not just going to give you a pre-roll right there right like you're not going to be able to light it up with a bunch of kids around secondhand smoke babies you know it's never going to fly so you know you go up there you get your popcorn you get your regular craft beer and then you get your mj infused beverage right did i hear right did biden tell the doj to take over to reschedule i'm late to the chat sorry matthew says yes yeah, so we discussed this earlier so they do this intentionally they try to keep things vague the DOJ is the is the entire department, and then the DEA is an agency within the department. <laughs> so they're one and the same. They were just it was the verbiage that they used. They were interchangeably using, you know, it's with the DOJ, which is the DEA part of the DOJ. And then same thing with the FDA. FDA is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. So it, they make it complicated like this for a reason, right? They, it's just to try to make it so that. You know, none of us know what the hell's going on. And so that we feel uncertainty and doubt. And, you know, that's the name of the game, right? When people are uncertain, they don't feel comfortable. But yeah, at the end of the day, it it doesn't make any sense to me. I posted on this uh, about this earlier and I mentioned it earlier in the video. You can just go back and rewatch it as well. But uh, to me, like the HHS and the FDA should be deciding whether or not it gets rescheduled hhs has already said you know the mounting evidence like they decide what's medicine and what's not <laughs> so and they administer food and drugs the doj the department of justice and the dea it's literally in the name enforcement so what are they doing having the final say and judgment call it should be they enforce the law and they figure out the the consequences if you break the law and then the fda and the hhs should create what is medicine and what is not like it's so stupid just doesn't make any sense. Like I said, it's always back asswards with these friggin' federal agencies. They just just makes absolutely no sense, right? What are the chances that OGI gets acquired, please? Uh, Silver, uh, that's that's a great question. Um, 
I mean, maybe in the mega merger blue chip phase in like a few years, but I can't see it like British American Tobacco investing like what $124 million into it, I think. Um, they're very differentiated. They're 100% MJ focused as well. Um, I really like OGI. It's one of my top picks as well. I mean, yeah, maybe it could get acquired eventually. Uh, I don't think it would be anytime soon. I think it'd be a great acquisition for another company or maybe they acquire another smaller company or something like that, but we'll see. Uh, I would say it's probably like a 50-50 chance at this point. Um, there's still going to be a lot of consolidation and mergers and acquisitions in the space. And yeah, I think OGI would be any company would be lucky to have it. Uh, it's a great company. Uh, and a third of their annual revenue was going towards almost a third of their annual revenue is going to excise taxes. So just imagine if we get improvements to that eventually, it's going to happen eventually. But uh, great question. Canada just lost its leadership in the MJ industry. Oh, Canada, oh, Canada, you just effed up. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, John. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, like I said, it's probably, they probably just want to get the smaller producers failing, right? They always say, oh, we're going to make it, we're going to make it just, we're going to make it fair. We're going to make it just as easy for the mom and pop shops to get into the business as well as the big alcohol and the big tobacco. It's like, okay, that's some BS if I ever heard it, right? <laughs> they're going to make it look like it. They're going to make it look like you can get into this industry, any kind of, you know, average Jane and Joe, but they'll just death by a thousand cuts, right? They'll tax you into, into oblivion. And they're like, oh, see, we told you you could get into the industry. We just, you just didn't, you just messed it up. You effed it up, right? It wasn't us. <laughs> it's like, we allowed you to get into the industry. We gave you a license. You just screwed up. It's like, yeah, but you didn't make it easier on me either. It's these companies that are, you know, public companies that can raise money by dilution and, uh, you know, that have uh, all this backing from these big Fortune 500 companies like Constellation Brands and all these companies, right, that get these cash injections. Well, you know, of course, like, <laughs> of course they're going to end up winning. So they, they, it's a mirage, right? It's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> I love the amount of puns that are coming out uh, of this stream. It's hilarious. But a rising high tide lifts all boats. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like eventually, you know, it's all part of their plan, right? They do this with every industry, the horse and buggy came around, you know, the car came around they're like, Oh, how do we stop this? Like we own this horse and buggy company. Like we need to put, we need to push the brakes. No pun intended again. This is great. Uh, we need to push the brakes on this because, uh, you know, we need to figure out a way to get into this car business. And it's like, same thing with MJ. Well, all these big alcohol and tobacco and opioid crooks makers, they're like, well, how do we get involved? I used to work for a pharmaceutical company. They made opioids and they got hit with, you know, billion dollar laws lawsuits because of the crisis. And guess what? The talk of the town was the last couple of years that I was working there. How do we get into this MJ business? We got to, it was all they talked about, right? We got to get their health Canada license. Got to get into this new medicine of the future, right? We lost all this money on, uh, on actual poison and the, these opioids and shit like that. Right. So it's just like, it's so freaking stupid. Same thing with big alcohol. They're trying to figure out a way to get their paws all over it. Big pharma, right? In my, opinion, in my opinion, unless the industry is in danger of truly falling, there's no need for the government to do anything at this point. It's not large enough to make a dollar difference or popular enough to gain a political advantage. Yeah, I agree. And I don't think they're like, yeah. I mean, I'm the most least political person ever, so maybe I don't even have any <laughs> uh, real uh, you know, things to add there. But um yeah, at the end of the day, I would agree with that statement. Like, it's it's going to be, it'll happen eventually. It's just, like I said, there's still a lot of growth to come in Canada. And eventually, we'll see it in convenience stores. Access to it will be a lot easier. We'll see it in, like, events and be able to go to restaurants and pubs and things like that. They'll have an MJ-infused beverage option. Eventually, it'll all be, it won't be segregated. It'll be one in the same, right? They'll bring it all under one house and one umbrella. And until then, there's that just shows that we're still so early, right? So... It's frustrating, it's impatience, kind of taking the best of us, but at the end of the day, um, it should make us all excited for the long term, unless you're like retiring next year, you know, and, and you're counting on this industry to, you know, kind of be your ticket to winning a lottery or something like that. And we're all in different stages of life too, right? But at the end of the day, um, you know, nothing happens overnight. And like I said, it's never been more true. The stock market is a mechanism from transferring wealth from the inpatient to the patient. Sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it happens over the course of decades, right? So it is what it is, unfortunately. What are your thoughts on next week following on how price would move with CGC following today? Could $3 be possible? I just did a video on CGC Easton, actually. Um, I mentioned that, you know, somewhere around that six to $5 mark USD, there's a ton of support around that area. So I, I am thinking still that that's probably going to be a nice area of support uh, today. 
I think we stopped the bleeding a little bit. Uh, actually, no, we did drop to a daily lower low today. So we hit 657. So I said like a while ago when we were at like nine bucks or 10 bucks, like we hit 1157. I just realized I'm not showing my screen here. Let me share my screen. Uh, so yeah, um, I mentioned like back here that, you know, after a 300% move, 320% move, we need to expect, you know, a 30, 40% pullback. And here we are from the top, uh, we're down over 43% and we could still see an EMA 12 and 26 bear cross on our way to daily oversold. And it looks very similar to the S&P 500, right? The S&P 500 just had a daily EMA 12 and 26 bear cross on our way to daily oversold, been consolidating for the last few days, really for the last couple of weeks. And if you look at CDC, a very similar price action. Uh, in terms of momentum and uh, sell pressure. So if SPY just had a bear cross of those EMAs and we're not yet daily oversold, kind of comparing that to SPY. Um, and if we go from our low to the high here on this move, you can see here that we're getting close to the 0.618 FIB retracements there at 613. So that's the next area to target. And we also have a higher low there at 570. And then after that, the 0.786 at 465. So again, you don't want to just be looking at one MJ stock either because what it, you can do the same thing. Take your swing low, swing high, and then you can see Tilray actually dropped below the 0.786. So it's actually given back uh, a lot, pretty much all of that move. And then you can even look at MSOS, the leader in the U.S., and say, okay, from our low, swing low to swing high, uh, we actually lost the 0.618 on our way to the 786. So the trend is most names are starting to give back, you know, 60 to 70%, 60 to 80%, I guess it is, of this move. So if we take a look at something similar for CDC and the weakness in the broader market, the S&P 500, something similar on deck here with the EMA 12 and 26 bear cross on our way to daily oversold. If we start to follow other leaders in the sector as well, like Tilray and MSOS, uh, then that would put us somewhere around that six to just under five bucks. So I, I don't think we're going to like dip to a lower low from here. I really can't see us going back like down below 276. Um, again, not telling you to buy, sell, or hold. This isn't financial advice. It's entertainment purposes only. But, um, you know, I, I do think that somewhere around here in the golden pocket is going to be where the bottom is going to be. So hopefully that helps. But yeah, I mentioned this yesterday. CGC got a lot of support in that $5, $6 area. We got the 10-week moving average at $5.75. We have the 50-weekly moving average there at $6 even. And then on the daily time frame, we have the 50 and the 200-day moving average in the fives as well. So 521 is the 50-day and uh, 200 days at 566. So I, I think, you know, anywhere around here is a decent area to start scaling in for the long term, in my opinion. But, um, you know, anywhere around, uh, I, I think somewhere around that 6 to uh, to $5 area is going to be where we'll potentially bottom out. And keep in mind, Canopy USA starting, we should see some insight into those financials later in the year, they said, uh, with that new share structure. So, like I said... While it's disappointing news today on excise tax, there's still a lot to be excited about in the MG industry. Safe banking, rescheduling, uplisting the NICE in the NASDAQ, full-blown descheduling eventually, Germany coming online, pillar two, rest of the EU, more individual states, Florida, Pennsylvania, Canada, store cap doubling in Ontario. You know, Eventually, excise tax will get improved, in my opinion, whether it be six months, a year from now. Even if, like I said, they reschedule to Schedule 3 in the U.S. and get rid of 280E, it's going to be many months before it actually gets enacted and goes away, right? So we got some time. And like I said, I, I think it's 100% by design. It's not coincidence that they're talking about the two major in industry things hindering the industry is taxation, both 280E and excise taxes. So the fact that this keeps coming up and is a big topic of discussion and, and uh, issue uh, is just, I, I think they're going to happen relatively around the same time. And the fact that excise tax didn't happen in Canada right away might mean that, you know, we could be looking a few months out before, at least a few months out minimum before we see Tweed Ego away. So I, I still think that it could happen. Rescheduling could happen. Uh, they say that usually it takes them about six months to go through their uh, rescheduling review. And it's been about that long now. So it would make the most sense to expect, you know, a potential announcement and approval of Schedule 3 uh, from the DEA or DOJ, whatever you want to call it, uh, at some point this month or, or next month. But I'm still in the camp of thinking we could get it. Uh, we have Saturday 420 coming up and I'll be giving away that annual membership. So hopefully uh, we can celebrate that as well. So it seems that all of that dump happened lately because whales knew. Yeah, I mean, also there's some speculation. There was some news that Florida uh, might not get the 60% required threshold to approve adult use sales, but I think it'll pass. 
personally, I think it's just FUD. So it's, uh, yeah, I already read that. SNDL 16K, 16K shares here. Nice. SNDL Oscar Whale in the house. It didn't happen, eh? <laughs> yeah, Shane, total Canadian comment. Yeah, did not happen, unfortunately. I'm buying the dips, and I believe Tilray will do relatively fly, fine if rates come down at some point and their investments will start to become profitable. But yeah, it's a slow burn on Tilray stock. Yep, I mean, like I said, it's it's just going to be you know a waiting game until we see rescheduling. If that happens, then we get medical channels opening in the U.S. and you know. Just think Germany, once Germany comes online, they're just medical right now. They have number one market share in Germany. Imagine in in a year or two, whenever they come online with adult use sales, like full-blown uh, rec sales and whatnot, and for-profit organizations, then it's just going to be, and then the rest of the EU, right? Like there's so many things coming. It's just going to be, like it, it, we're at least a few years out. Like there's no way we're going to be seeing these companies at all-time highs, new price discovery across the sector, right? Remember 2018, 2019 when, all MJ stocks were just busting into new highs, all-time highs every day, a new company hitting a new all-time high. We're at least, you know, a few years out, like two or three years out minimum, in my opinion, before we start to see that kind of market dynamic again. But again, we just need to change our mindset. It's not going to stay low forever, and the the plant's not going anywhere. The industry's not going anywhere. If you look at, you know, Congress and uh, political uh, groups and governments around the world, it just seems like MJ's at, you know, the tip of everybody's tongue. So uh, this is great. It's just... It's taking a long time to break this, you know, decades and decades and decades of propaganda and stigma that and lies that were basically fed to us, right? Shoved down our throat. Germany, my only hope. <laughs> Is CGC going to remain all under one ticker? I believe so. Yeah, I th I'm hearing, like, I mentioned that I didn't think that they would ch uh, trade on the NASDAQ because it wouldn't really make any sense. Like, you can't have operations in the U.S. and be listed on the NASDAQ. Um, and then I'm hearing rumblings that it won't be on the TSX either. And I know that Canopy said that basically they're going to have an option on their website where you can go and uh, request your exchangeable shares and then they'll transfer it to the transfer agent. So, um, and it's probably going to be like a private holding company, right? So uh, it, it's like I said, I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to like exchangeable shares and all this, <laughs> you know, these complicated novel structures. There are novel structures for a reason. And, uh, you know, I can only imagine the amount of legal power and firepower that they have behind them, right? And then trying to please the NASDAQ and the SEC. Um, it's definitely not... I mean, even the SEC had doubts about it and questions about it, and the NASDAQ did as well, and they were giving them a pushback. So um, it's. It, I think it's kind of like new ground that we're breaking here, right? But overall, it's great for, in my opinion, because it's going to see other companies like, you know, Tilray's and... SNDLs, your organograms of the world, they now have the blueprint. We, we know they can do the same now, right? So Tilray has convertible debt in MedMed. Could we potentially see them scoop them up? Like I think the stock's still halted. Um, could they potentially scoop them up, create a U.S. holdings company? Similar type structure, we'll see. But as far as I'm aware, I'm, the, like, the new shares aren't going to be traded on an exchange. 5,455 shares at 284 for Tilray, ride or die. Ride or die, baby, diamond hands, love it. Love it, Joseph. Rich or divorced? <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? You know what the, the number one cause of marriage is? Or, uh, sorry, you know what the number one cause of divorce is? Marriage. <laughs> the above comment. <laughs> All right, always a pleasure. Going to wrap it up. Going to go hang some art over at the Airbnb. You should see this new art piece. My buddy owns a print company, like a canvas design company, and the sweet uh, downtown uh, scene of uh, Edmonton lit up at nighttime and I'm uh, going to hang it at the new Airbnb. I'll do some before and after photos, per perhaps uh, post something on X or on the community tab on YouTube and uh, maybe mention it in one of my videos. Maybe I'll do a short video or something like that too, give you some like before and after shots. But uh, yeah, my second Airbnb property and it's looking fantastic. It's so dope. So sad that it didn't pass, but that's okay. But in your opinion, do you think till right now is a higher chance of doing a split? Oh, like a reverse split? Nah, I can't see that happening. I mean, their shares are pretty high. I think we're like seven hundred some million shares, but you know, I don't. I don't think that's the end of the world. Like Aurora had like over a billion shares at some point, and you know, it is what it is. Like at one point uh, during that craze there in f March of twenty twenty three, Tilray had like two point two billion dollars traded just on the Nasdaq stock, which it was like getting close to like I forget. I think. 
Erwin Simon said something. He compared it to like Apple or the amount of demand and shares in Apple or something like that. Or maybe it was um, Tesla. Maybe it was both of them or whatever. But like we were pushing like similar shares, like not too far off of like some of these, uh, you know, trillion dollar companies. So, you know, again, like I don't think Tilray is going to be an Amazon. Like we're not going to be a trillion dollar market cap or trillion dollar valuation. Right. It you know might get to 100 billion or a 200 billion, you know, at the high end, I can't see like going much more than that. Like, you know, Budweiser, look at Budweiser. What's Budweiser's market cap real quick. Anheuser Bush market cap. Bring it up. Bud. Yeah, their market cap, Anheuser Bush, 115 billion, right? So, I mean, they're selling poison, Tilray selling poison and medicine <laughs> through through their craft beer and uh and want, uh spirits and stuff like that but uh yeah i mean if anheuser bush the maker of budweiser is uh you know 115 billion dollar us i could easily see and plus canopy hit like a 20 billion dollar market cap 17 or 18 billion dollar us market cap in just on the canada legalizing right so um yeah easily easily until we could hit a 40 billion dollar market cap and that would put us at like 50 dollars a share right assuming there's no more dilution or whatever and shares at it but um you know get to a 100 billion dollar market cap and you're looking at like i think like 150 dollars a share per tilray right so i think you know if canopy can hit 20 billion on canada legalizing imagine what happens when the u.s legalizes and then like five years after that right i think tilray could easily be at 50 billion market cap and then ultimately 100 billion market cap in a decade or two but yeah i think you know 50 billion could happen like this decade like before 2030 and then that would put tilray somewhere around 50 bucks a share right i don't think it's going to 300 again anytime soon like that but you know crazier things have happened but uh, at the end of the day you know i think 50 billion market cap and somewhere around that 50 dollars a share 40 50 dollars a share uh, over the next few years is easily doable especially if we get enough of the catalyst strung together right we get rescheduling state banking full-blown descheduling florida on the ballot you know, approved Pennsylvania, rest of Germany comes online, the EU, Canada sees excise tax reform, a whole bunch of other stuff. We start to see it in Super Bowl ads and, you know, we start to see regular advertising. We start to see, you know, convenience stores, we start to see it in concerts and events, sporting events, all this stuff. Like there's so much stuff, right? It's just like, we're so early. It's not even funny. Thank you, bro. Team power. Thank you very much. Thanks for the stream updates. You bet. But yeah, I don't think Tilray is going to do a split to be honest. Even if it did, it wouldn't be the end of the world because like CGC just did it and it went from $2 to like 12 bucks. <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe we want a rubber split, do we? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think it's the end of the world. It's just a way for the friggin' Wall Street's crooks to manipulate the market, right? They they do regular stock splits because Amazon gets too expensive. Oh, it's $1,000, $2,000. I can't buy a $2,000 stock. Then they do a one for 20 reverse split. It's like, oh, it's 100 bucks now. Um, yeah, I have 100 bucks. I can buy one share and then they crash at 80%, right? <laughs> Just exit liquidity on the regular stock split and reverse stock splits are just to prevent things from being delisted. And then the big institutions come in 80%, 90% drop, buy it from all the scared retail investors. They do a reverse split. They stay on the NASDAQ and then they're fine. Five, 10 years from now ends up being massive company, right? So you're a badass. Thanks for your help. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. No, you. <laughs> All right, going to end it there. Thanks again, everybody, uh, for joining the stream. It was a pleasure, as always. Thanks again for joining us on The Pursuit of Wealth. It's Rod with Power Group, and uh, we'll do it again soon. All right, have a great night. See you on the next video.